<clears throat> okay, I'm going to take off the pause. And <coughs> so basically, I, I do appreciate it uh, that you all came out. And uh, this, this uh, was originally done as part of Ethics Week. We had about, I don't know, 50 or 60 people in the audience. Is uh, well, well, I need to be able to read this thing. <laughs> well, it's hard to read that black. Yeah, it looks like this is uh, all an all or nothing thing here as far as the lights go. Uh, Oh well, no! Wait a second. That leave that on. Yeah. I I I can see that. Okay. That's good because uh, yeah, it's a little little bit of a dark PowerPoint. Okay, so that'll be a nice smooth start to the recording. Um, <laughs> well, I'll begin then. It's good to see you all. Uh, th this deals basically with the ethical justification that's given for um, for aggressive action to mitigate the effects of, of climate, climate change or global warming and uh, with what with the ethical at least the ostensible ethical argument that's usually given as, as a reason for public policy decisions. Uh, and what I find is that that argument fits a, a, a very old pattern of reasoning that Aristotle called a practical syllogism. A syllogism is a logical argument. Uh, the reason it was called a practical syllogism is in a normal uh, piece of reasoning, a normal syllogism, the conclusion is a proposition, a statement that you are supposed to accept as true or believe on the basis of the argument. But um, a practical syllogism has as its conclusion not something you ought to believe, but basically something you um, ought to do. Um, you know, it, it concludes that a particular action is appropriate uh, based on what the argument justifies. Uh, and what I'm saying here, uh, as you'll see, is that uh, applied ethics is not just about ethics. It's not only about ethics in the sense that it is not only about abstract ethical principles, but applied ethics brings into play particular facts about the world. Okay, well I'm going to read most of it, but uh, uh, I've got supplementary slides and uh, I, th I thought I'd have a Miss Robbins <coughs> here and I'd read from over there, but since I've got me to flip the slides, I'm standing over here. Okay, is ethics only about ethics? While well, my paper is not primarily intended to target professionals in this field, I should perhaps mention at the outset that there is an area of ethics called metaethics, which focuses on the field of ethics itself as its area of study. It deals with foundational considerations like arriving at proper definitions for the most basic concepts used within the subject, and whether there might in fact be a single correct method for approaching and answering ethical questions. As meta-ethics centers only on ethics, uh, for this area of the subject, the answer to my question is, I'm afraid, a trivial and rather uninteresting yes. That is, for meta-ethics, it is only about ethics. If we, however, shift the ground from talking about whether there is a single correct method for answering ethical questions, and not everyone believes that there is, and move on instead to actually using 
such a method ourselves, then we are out of the area of the merely abstract and theoretical and onto the practical, down-to-earth turf of applied ethics where you and I live when we make our moral decisions on a daily basis. And it is in the area of applied ethics that we will dwell for most of the remainder of this paper. But first, a brief meta-ethical discussion on method is in order as it relates to our central question. Without doubt, the most long-standing and entrenched method used for approaching ethical questions and reasoning through them to an answer concerning what we ought to do uh, dates all the way back to ancient Greece and employs a form of reasoning the philosopher Aristotle called the practical syllogism. Considered by many contemporary ethicists to be as relevant today as it was then, it is a pattern of reasoning that you probably use many times yourself without knowing it. In its essentials, it looks like this. There's a premise which gives you um, an ethical, a general ethical principle. Um, we ought to tell the truth. We uh, ought to keep our agreements, things like that. Um, but in addition to general ethical principles, this form of argument cites particular facts about the world and it is those particular facts that <clears throat> determine whether that general ethical principle applies concretely to a, a, a real situation in the real world. And then because this is a practical syllogism, this conclusion is not just a uh, a proposition, a statement that one is to believe on the basis of the argument, but it's a conclusion about what we are morally required to do. So this pattern of moral reasoning shows us clearly that applied ethics is not only about ethics. The conclusion that we ought to do about what we ought to do describes our ethical obligations and the role we use as a premise in our argument clearly relates to a moral standard, but tying together this abstract moral standard with our concluded moral obligation in a specific concrete situation are particular relevant facts relating to the situation in question, facts not themselves, specifically part of ethics proper. Thus, ethics is not only about ethics when we're talking about applied ethics, but also about particular facts that obtain in the world. Now, contemporary ethicist William Frankina, whose little book on ethics I used to use as a text, illustrated Aristotle's practical syllogism with reasoning process Socrates used to decide whether he should accept his friend's offer to facilitate his escape from prison into exile thus enabling him to avoid the death sentence which had been uh, meted out to him by the Athenian courts. Effectively using several practical syllogisms, Socrates mulls over issues like whether he has a moral obligation to keep his agreements, whether he should obey his parents, and whether we should return harm for harm and retaliation if wronged unjustly. It is important to him that he now do the right thing, not just the prudent thing, because he sincerely believes that harming his soul ethically will have negative repercussions for him not only in this life but in the next. It would literally be a fate worse than the imminent death he now faces. To illustrate the practical syllogism in action, uh, one of his arguments might be summarized as follows, and this is not exactly the way Frank and, uh, <clears throat> sum, uh, summarizes it, but it's pretty close. So you've got a particular fact. As a citizen, I haven't understood agreement with Athens to obey its laws and respect its court's verdicts. Uh, I'm sorry. 
start with a general rule. We ought to keep our agreements. Right? And then the particular fact I just read, a second particular fact that by escaping into exile, by accepting my friend's uh, uh, offer to bribe the guards and bail me out, uh, by escaping into exile, I would in effect be overturning the court verdict which sentenced me to death. And the conclusion then is something Socrates should not do, which is accept the offer of escape. And using similar reasoning, uh, Socrates concludes by bringing in additional factual considerations such as that the city of Athens has indeed uh, been like a parent to him and would in fact be harmed by his escape as law is so essential to a city's very existence would be broken by this course of action um, that he should stay and face his sentence uh, that he is morally obligated not to escape that's the conclusion of his reasoning now whether we agree with Socrates reasoning or his ultimate moral choices here, not the point. The point is that the most time-honored method for addressing an ethical issue and for reasoning oneself through it to a course of action on a moral question brings into play not only abstract ethical considerations but concrete particular facts about the world. Part of the process of answering an ethical question by the use of a practical syllogism, therefore, is not just one of figuring out what abstract moral principles might relate uh, to in a given situation, but it's also one of getting one's facts straight. It is the facts relating to a specific situation that determine whether a general moral rule even applies to it. Yet it would seem that the process of getting our facts straight should be the easiest part of resolving a moral quandary. After all, it is facts that are observable and intersubjectively verifiable using empirical methods, using observational methods. Abstract considerations of tastes and values are not. For example, Mary and her college roommate can easily agree on the color of the dress Mary just bought for their big double date this weekend, but they may strongly disagree on whether or not the dress is beautiful. And uh, you know, the question is, uh, are there any objective ways of settling such a disagreement? Historically, some philosophers have argued that matters of moral value are like matters of taste, not settleable observationally. People like the uh, logical positivists and their emotive theory of ethics. Now, while many, if not most, contemporary ethicists have long ago abandoned the stark moral relativism and contempt for moral reasoning, that this observation implies, that is, that ethical uh, judgments are just like aesthetic judgments, matters of taste. In other words, can I really convince you with abstract reasoning that you should prefer chocolate ice cream to butter pecan? Is rational debate even possible on such a matter of taste? And if not on them, then why on ethical matters? If they are mere matters of taste. Um, so, so most philosophers have abandoned this and, and maintain a confidence that it is indeed possible to seek reasoned solutions to moral problems. That this issue um, was ever raised at all clearly indicates that on the face of it, facts seem a lot easier to confirm than values. But the remainder of my paper will take it up with challenging this initially plausible assumption by focusing at some length on the elusiveness of facts in the current moral debate over climate change. Now at this point somebody is undoubtedly saying to himself or herself, debate over climate change? I thought the debate over climate change is now over. A consensus 
on the issue now existing among reputable scientists in the field. Well, Al Gore notwithstanding, I can assure you that this is decidedly not the case and that as Mark Twain might have put it, the death of the climate change debate has been greatly exaggerated. First of all, um, I want to underscore the importance and centrality of the practical syllogism, specifically to the climate change debate, through brief reference to a recent study published in the Journal for Activism in Science and Technology Education, in which the authors examined approximately 50 science lessons with a view toward developing recommendations for incorporating ways to integrate more moral reasoning into the climate change curriculum. Citing an anthology called Moral Ground, Ethical Action for a Planet in Peril, and agreeing with its editor's claim that, quote, society has not acted to avert the harms of climate change because the affirmation of moral responsibilities has been missing from public discourse, end quote. They follow these editors' adoption of the practical syllogism as a paradigm for the moral reasoning that will enable us to deduce those moral responsibilities. In their study, they reproduce the anthology's editor's example, which is something like this, and I've reverse the order of the premises, but you'll see it's basically the same uh, form. The moral premise is the second one I've listed. We have a moral obligation not to do things that will harm future generations. Carbon dioxide emissions worsen the effects of climate change on future generations. Um, therefore, we have a moral obligation to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, readers should easily see that except for the order of the premises, this is the same form of argument I presented earlier as the practical syllogism. A good central starting point for our discussion of the debate, and one from which we can branch out in other directions, is a little piece penned a few years ago by renowned meteorologist Joe Bastardi. Um, while, while making it clear that he is speaking for himself and not for his longtime employer AccuWeather, he now has his own company called Weather Bell Analytics, um, Bastardi laments the fact that defenders of anthropogenic that is, man caused global warming, have tried to stifle debate on the issue and have reached wrong conclusions by failing to get their facts straight, straight in two principal ways. Number one, they have ignored well documented and observationally confirmed facts from the past, especially those concerning ocean regime changes and their clear effect on the weather and two, have too often treated the projections of computer models as fact. Now this um, last consideration is very important uh, for the rest of the paper. Uh, in other words, for observationally confirmed evidence they have substituted as facts instead the projections, the questionable projections of computer models. If we take into account the cold hard facts obtained from observation, uh, he contends that we, um, that we have more reason to conclude that the world is in a 15 to 20 year period of global cooling, not global warming as signaled by the similarity of the 2007 La Nina to one which occurred in 1950 to 51 and reverse the 30-year warming trend to a cooling trend which extended throughout most of the 1960s. And as had one who's lived through them, yes, things were much colder back then, much more snow. 
There are climate cycles, and the facts tell us that, quote, what is occurring now has occurred before. This first colder than normal year worldwide is one of the signs that we are getting ready to go back to a colder cycle on the order of 15 to 20 years, and the past several years have also been cooling years. They show us that in the end, it is nature, not man, that will have its way with the weather. Um, other research bears Bastardi out on this, a 2007 article entitled a new dynamical mechanism for major climate shifts contends that ocean oscillations could alone account for most of the Earth's warming and cooling over the past 50 years. But rather than taking into account the observational evidence, Bastardi claims that defenders of anthropogenic global warming, and that's what we're concerned about, not just whether the planet is warm, warming, but whether uh, man-made causes are a significant factor in this anthropogenic human created. Um, would, would rather discard or ignore facts of the past relating to recurring climate patterns and instead place their faith in future projections made by computer models. Evidencing some of the shortcomings of these models to account for ocean regime changes, he cites their predictive failures relating to then recent La Nina El Nina patterns. On these changes, the models are, to put it in Bastardi's own words, clueless. A far more extensive and technical analysis of the shortcomings of computer models for making climate predictions, especially for those relied on ex extensively uh, by the United Nations Intergovernmental <coughs> Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has been offered by Christopher Moncton in the newsletter of the Forum on Physics and Society. While the technical details of his landmark 2007 article challenge um, and this challenge to the veracity of IPCC model projections lies well beyond the scope of this paper. It's a very scientific and technical article. I think we can understand the main point he makes, which is that, and this is a quote from which is that the IPCC's methodology relies unduly, indeed almost exclusively, upon numerical analysis, even where the outputs of the models upon which it so heavily relies are manifestly and significantly at, various, at variance um, with theory or observation or both. Model projections, such as those upon which the IPCC's entire case rests, have long been proven impossible when applied to mathematically chaotic objects, such as the climate, whose initial state can never be determined to a sufficient precision." End of the quote. Specifically, where does Moncton think that the IPCC projections have gone wrong due to their overly optimistic reliance on computer models inadequate to the task of making long-range climate projections for such a complex and mathematically chaotic object. Well, the central question in the scientific debate over whether and to what extent, if any, human beings have warmed the planet or warmed the climate since the start of the Industrial Revolution of Moncton, that central question revolves around the notion of what is called climate sensitivity which is, quote, the magnitude of the change, let's go to slide seven here, which is the um, magnitude of the change of T sub S, which is the global average temperature, um, 
the globally average land and sea surface absolute temperature, T sub S, and what is reached after doubling CO2 concentration from the pre-industrial 278 parts per million to approximately 550 parts per million, um, which is the level you would say is uh, now in the atmosphere. So it is precisely in predicting this temperature change accurately that IPCC computer models have fallen far short of actual observed values. The then most current comprehensive statement from the IPCC on this was contained in its fourth assessment report, which estimated that the likely rise in T sub S in response to sustained industrial CO2 levels at 550 parts per million, uh, which estimated the temperature rise at from 2 to 4.5 degrees centigrade. The IPCC contention is that human activity, especially that productive of CO2 emissions, has been responsible for more than half of this projected temperature rise and will continue to contribute to a similar level of temperature rise in the future with serious negative effects unless, unless significant steps are taken through policies and agreements to mitigate the situation by curtailing worldwide CO2 emissions. But the factual premise <coughs> supporting the moral argument for immediate, perhaps <coughs> drastic action worldwide to attempt to head off the supposed dire consequences of climate change rests on the veracity of the models. As partial evidence supporting the deep flaws in their projections, uh, Moncton at the time cited the following uh, diagram representing an early 1988 attempt to predict the effects of CO2 emissions on the rise of T sub S through the year 2020. Now, what's going on here? Well, um, while not itself generated by the IPC, <coughs> it pretty much concurred with that report's findings. Um, now, What's going on here is that, um, let, let, let me read what I've got and then I may uh, explain further. Hansen, its author, presented this chart before Congress using it to underscore his case for urgent action to prevent the projected temperature rise represented in lines B and C. Uh, in other words, temperatures are on the left of that diagram. Lines B and C are basically projections based on the computer models of um, what they think um, global temperatures will do if we double uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so he made this case to Congress then uh, arguing for urgent action then to project to um, prevent this projected rise uh, above and the IPCC based on its own model projections was right there as well as seen from D. So that center line which pretty much um, projects the same type of rise uh, is the uh, projected rise based on what um, UN publications projected um, and the computer models used by the UN. So uh, his, Hansen's contention then was that decisive global action on curbing CO2 concentrations could stabilize the situation at a much lower level represented by the green line A up there, avoiding the projected temperature rise with its attendant 
negative consequences. But the bottom line factual point illustrated by the above graph is that the actual global temperature rise based on observational evidence through 2007 represented by the red, it's a little hard to see it, but the solid red line E uh, is the actual temperature rise and then the dotted red line going to the end of the graph is um, projections up to 2020 based on uh, what it has done so far. Uh, so what is E? E is the actual observed um, rise in temperature. Um, it was by contrast much lower and indeed closer to the stabilized figure Hansen hoped to achieve only if significant reductions in CO2 emissions were attained, all taking place during a period of rapid rise in CO2 emissions. Um, the much feared projected warming just was not happening. So, um, the what Hansen was saying is that the uh, lower lines that you see on the graph were um, what would happen if we significantly curtail uh, CO2 emissions via policy um, changes. Uh, however, we need not be content with looking at quarter century old charts to see the flaws in the IPCC's model projections. With the benefit of hindsight, we can make the same case from the most recent data available. Now, remember, I originally wrote this paper. Um, the reason I could do this on such short notice is I, I gave this three years ago, almost to the day uh, at, at Essex. Um, as part of their ethics day, and so, um, but but really things have not changed very significantly since then. I mean, uh, at any rate, actual observations since 2007, as we shall see, have continued to undermine the veracity of its model projections of significant warming. So slide nine. Um, First of all, through a 2012 look back at the Hansen NASA model, Hansen uh, NASA, NASA employee, continues to show its predictive failures as warming has continued only modestly, uh, much on the same line observed <coughs> by Moncton in 2007. So, what you're looking at here is um, the green line up there is Hansen's uh, predictions um, in two different scenarios, scenario A and scenario <coughs> B, but, but notice they, they all predict a significant global temperature wise. Um, and what he was arguing for is that um, significant action could um, scenario C represents global temperatures of CO2 emissions had been limited to the year 2000 CO2 emission levels. So uh, what Hansen was arguing is that in that uh, light blue line um, called C, and I, I know you guys can't see the, the letters from here, but uh, the, the, the point is uh, if, if significant uh, changes were made, then that's where um, we could keep CO2 emission levels. However, actual data in contrast to what Hansen predicted with his NASA model not only has not shown the significant warming he projected, but has actually shown a slight cooling trend of fall in T sub S. Um, and compare this model's 
predicted failure with that of a similar one used by the IPCC. So uh, the, the point is that um, what you see as The the green dots in the black line are actual uh, annual global temperature. So, in other words, note that the black line, the very dark line, is where they actually are, and they are close to Hansen's blue line of what would only happen if, um, you know, policies were put into effect to significantly uh, restrict CO2 emissions to back uh, to two year 2000 levels. Can I ask you a question? So compare. I, uh, think, I, yeah. know, I think I know the answer, but other people may be wondering. So there's this dark line, the black line, and then there's the pink line. These are two different recordings, right? So that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle because is that what that is? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, this is something where I, uh, okay, the pink dots are yeah, yeah, are, are had crude. Right. The, um, yeah, so, so, right. So there, so there are two um, things representing actual observed temperatures, and they're very sim they're very close. Right. Um, so uh, good, good point to to make. Um, so again, I, I say compare this model's predicted failure with that of a similar one used by the IPC, whose parallel projections for significant warming have also not materialized as discerned from actual observed data, and so that's what I have in the next slide. Uh, okay. Not used to clicking that mouse with my left hand. Um, note how much lower are the actual observed temperatures from those projected by the model. So basically, uh, the model projections are what you see at the top um, for the UN um, in, in their various um, publications um, on this. And the, um, now, so the actual temperatures are what is well, here, let me, let me read some of what's here. Oh. The IPCC climate model pre predictions versus reality. Purple dots lines are actual annual um, head crude three global temperatures. Blue, green, and red lines represent IPCC global temperature predictions for business as usual CO2 emissions. The orange line, the commitment line, that you see in the middle represents global temperatures if CO2 emissions uh, had been limited to agreed upon 2000 levels as was argued we need to do with uh, drastic policy considerations and and the point is the the pinkish line there um, represents actual observed temperatures, which are very close to um, to what they were supposed to um, achieve only if, if significant uh, uh, you know, carbon emissions um, mitigation procedures were put up <coughs> into effect. Okay, so, so another chart of RSS satellite global temperature measurements confirms that there's been a cooling trend worldwide since 1997. Um, that is, we have since then 184 months, now this was when I wrote it, of cooling, not warming as 
predicted by NASA in the IPCC models, and that's in slide 12 here. Um, basically, red and blue curves are second order uh, trends. But, I mean, basically, what you see going uh, a across the middle are actual levels. Uh, and, and, and notice these temperature levels have, been, have remained relatively constant throughout this period, even though uh, that black line uh, represents a significant uh, rise in the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So, you know, in other words, it's not having a significant effect on uh, the average temperatures. Um, so this um, absence of, of uh, warming has happened in the face then of steadily rising atmospheric CO2 levels as indicated by the black line. Interestingly, after um, presenting this graph, the author, as we have done, takes pains to point out explicitly that, quote, the slight cooling trend is opposite to that of the IPCC and NASA's James Hansen predicted for global temperatures uh, to what they had predicted. Uh, end of quote as well. He presents in some detail the main factual premise in the moral argument over climate change as an hypothesis which needs support from model projections which clearly have now failed. So, um, I, I should have had this in the thing, and I didn't. Um, but what, is, what he says, this is quoting, the IPCC prediction of rapid global warming is based on the hypothesis that human CO2 emissions would increase atmospheric CO2 greenhouse gas levels. The increase of greenhouse gases would allow more radiated heat to be retained. The retained heat would warm the atmosphere, and the atmosphere would then warm the world's oceans and land surfaces. Since predicted warming would set in motion, quote, a runaway tipping point, uh, something Al Gore is, um, likes to refer to, um, that would it, it would set in motion a runaway tipping point that would produce catastrophic climate disasters and a doomsday for civil civilization. But compare this with the actual premise we looked at earlier. A in other words, this argument is, uh, you know, compare this with the factual premises that we were looking at earlier. One says, if we do not act soon, anthropogenic environmental changes will bring serious harms to the future, basically the future of the planet. And the other factual premise we looked at earlier, carbon dioxide emissions worsen the effects of climate change on future generations. That is, the main factual premise in the moral argument for dramatic and urgent action on climate change becomes an hypothesis whose main support is coming from computer model projections. Um, and these projections have been undermined by observational evidence. Not reading my own stuff very well. Curiously, NASA's Hansen, and we're coming in the home stress, curiously, NASA's Hansen has made recent news, uh, news a few years ago, with a moral argument whose factual premise is essentially the same one listed above, arguing, quote from Hansen, the current generations have an overriding moral duty to their children and grandchildren to take immediate action, end of quote, to curb the supposed dire consequences of human and climate change. He calls this, quote, an issue of intergenerational justice on a par with ending slavery, end of quote. But we've just seen that as empirical evidence shows that the global temperature rises predicted 
by his model will not follow, then neither will the destructive consequences he thinks we will bring on future generations through our greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, if the facts aren't there, the conclusion of the moral of the uh, uh, practical syllogism is not supported. Hence, the crusade he wants to start for the adoption of a carbon tax worldwide to affect the 6% reduction in CO2 emissions seems as a consequence to lack his claimed moral foundation. If there is no such emergency, then there is no legitimate moral argument supporting such dire emergency measures. The factual premise of any such argument being false. Um, so, some of the more diplomatic defenders of the model projections uh, and the clear variance of their pro predictions with observational data have described the unexpected stasis in warming over the past 15 years, now about 18 years, or so is simply a period in which global warming is at a standstill, obviously leaving open the door that it may resume again at any time. This, of course, raises the specter of whether this attempt to save their hypothesis from falsification by observational data is not, in fact, akin to that of Ptolemaic astronomers' attempts to save their own view of the heavens from falsification by observational evidence through the use of artificial devices like epicycles to explain the retrograde motion of the planets. In other words, there shouldn't be retrogration, retrograde motion if as the Ptolemaic system um, maintained, the planets were located on crystalline spheres. But rather than give up their theory, Ptolemaic astronomers said, well, we can account for ret retrograde motion by bringing in epispheres. The planets are actually on smaller spheres attached to the larger spheres. Yeah, you can do a lot to save a theory if you want to. Uh, so, at any rate, you can say, is that just a hedge which in the end will fail to do its job? Now, I, I had put some other charts uh, relevant to AR5, which had just come out. But, but it's pretty much more of the same thing. So anyway, um, that is all I had. But, you know, that was basically the points I was going to make. Uh, and, and it's a contrarian point of view, but we philosophers are sometimes called upon to be gadflies, so I'm kind of a gadfly on this one. Uh, and I don't know if we... Uh, okay, uh, these are just predictions, right? If they're all predictions, there is no need for moral justification, is there? Well, well that, that's the point. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're saying we need drastic action on the basis of what our future predictions um, say about possible you know, global temperature rise and, and the catastrophic consequences that might produce. And um, yeah, uh, right, they're saying drastic action is needed now because of what we predict for the future, what we're saying these predictions for the past now 18 years have, have been failing one right after another. You know. I, I would say that if the facts supported it, no then fact. it would justify future action. That's For example, no I think the facts yeah. support that bees right. worldwide, pollinators, are in big trouble. And we need mm -hmm. to find out why, why and solve that because mm -hmm. that can yeah, really yeah, mess yeah, up right, the world. Right. Is it, is it uh, yeah. the effects of uh, it's one of the pesticides they're yeah. saying. Right now they don't know for it. sure, but that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you're right. That seems to be implicated. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Why and said, we don't know why. 
Well, th th there's disagreement, I think, but to, based on what I've read, there's enough evidence to suggest that we at least ought to be seeing what happens if you cut out using the, the nicotine-based pesticides. There are other issues because there are diseases, but the thing is that diseases come in when the community is stressed. So these bees are being put under stress for some reason. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you can't just say that you can let the pesticides off the hook just because there's all there's diseases involved. But to me, this is mm -hmm. totally different. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, well, I have a lot yeah. of questions, yeah. but one is, if it's as simple okay. as this, why are those of us that feel the way you do not being successful in the public relations field? Because we're not. I don't think most of you are. Yeah, I, I, well, train here, well, well that, that, that's certainly true. Uh, I mean, uh, y you know, here we get in the realm of whether, um, well, well, you know, Kuhn's point about normal science, the fact that it's hard to, to go against the flow, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, a lot, you can say a lot of uh, entrenched scientific institutions have a lot of, Things um, invested in in this in the computer model scenario being being accurate, and 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 what it might tell about the future, and and um, you know, so, so you seem to be going against a lot of institutionalized um, you know science for that. Yeah, and and, and of course there. Oh, yeah, good. No, I didn't well, well I, 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 okay. Well, I mean, it, it seems to me they're not simply antithetical. I mean, isn't there the possibility there's some compromise? I mean, it's not simply one group of scientists saying, no, there's been, there's no evidence. There's been no climate change. And then there's another group that are alarmist and say, oh, if we have to prepare mm -hmm. for catastrophe. Isn't there some middle ground where they say, yes, there's, is a warming trend, but it's not as going to be as devastating as we think. It's a slower. And don't doesn't the experimental um, evidence show that there is? I mean, it's not quite as well. Well, I'm I'm, I'm just saying recently, no. And, and and of course, the arguments of people like Bastardi are that. That, that things like El Nino ocean oscillations have more to do with, um, you know, global climate temperatures worldwide than, than um, a anything uh, man can do with increased CO2 emissions. Well. And that, um, y y you know, that, that, that those are causing the planet to, to cool, not warm. So, by story oh. says there's really no global warming or the global warming there is well well he's not. saying he's saying that um <coughs> that 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 some of the projected models supporting um a warming trend have failed and that um that they one significant reason for their Predicting such a level of warming is because they do not take into effect, and here we get uh, taking all the data, relevant data, into account. They do do not take into account relevant data concerning ocean oscillations, which perhaps, if taken into account, would not um, have those models predicting near the. T the global mean temperature increase that, that they do. No, but it seems to me that they, they do have techniques involved mm -hmm. to simply measure whether the overall temperature of the Earth is increasing or decreasing. How? Oh, I, actually, I actually don't think that is nearly as simple as it's being made out to be. And, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you look at, like, the divergence in that one where we saw mm -hmm. there was a couple of a tenth of a degree or at least a tenth of a degree difference in the empirical data. And, you know, there are really mm -hmm. there's a lot of arguments going on right now about whose data is better, you know? Because right. what do you yeah. measure? Do you measure the, the average air temperature? Um, uh, one of the things that's been discovered recently is that there's a, there's a, there's a systematic bias 
in, contempor in the temperature record because a site that was created, say, in 1930 as a weather station, and at that time there was fields around it, and now there's a parking lot around it. And there's an airport next day. Well, does that affect? <laughs> Absolutely, that is going to affect. Yeah, yeah. sure. The, got all kinds of heat. The herb, urban I heat island would, effect. Would, 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 uh, as someone who lives in a urban urban heat, heat island. I mean, I suppose I'm just saying, do we have to be so antithetical? Is no, I, you're, you, there, no, um, you're you're making a room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. discussion saying, well, there's mm -hmm. a possible, even the ones who say, well, we there are people called lukewarm, we really don't know mm -hmm. how to mm -hmm. say this yes, thing. Um, yeah. We don't know how to predict mm -hmm. this yeah. thing. But we don't know how mm -hmm. to Both models mm -hmm. show a warming trend. It's just the degree to which the warming trend, that's the yeah, degree. It's not a Both line. models are going up. Yeah, yeah but, but actual, and, and this is the okay. question I want to ask. The projection is alarming, but it's not. As bad as that. Well, one, one projection is a warming, but the other one also shows an increase in global warming. So my question is, are those projections of the actual, they're not taking into account the population growth, the deforestation, the you know agriculture, agribusiness that's going to increase as more people populate the planet, and that's going to change that number as all those other higher, things, right? yeah, yeah. That yeah. as all those other things take yeah. place, yeah. And well, we well, are in an ice age, right? Yeah, and we're yeah. Still well, we'll see. Um, in an ice age. It, 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 the, the, now I uh, look. I, I can't say exactly what they say, but certainly part of what goes into the argument that for the purposes of the models, we're going to double CO two. Mm -hmm. um, concentrations in the atmosphere, and then see where that leads. Um, that takes into account things that you're mentioning as causes of the doubling of the CO2 in the mm -hmm. atmosphere. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know. But the actual, the actual isn't taking that into consideration as the population increases and oh, as no. our business increases no, and as the deforestation of the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the precious Amazon rainforest <laughs> and all that other stuff, mm -hmm. which creates enormous additions well, to heat. Yeah, well, well, I mean, there certainly are some things that we can do, right, uh, that, that are planting not trees, good but bad. Mm -hmm. but planting trees mm -hmm. is, to me, something that everybody should be able to agree on, mm -hmm. a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because uh, trees yeah. fix carbon dioxide. Yeah. This uh, is one of the issues. Mm -hmm. I have people say, well, carbon dioxide is pollution. Well, not the plants. Know, just the whole way in which yeah. we go about describing the issue. It's food for plants. That's why if you have a greenhouse, yeah. you actually yeah. pump extra CO2 into so it, it so mm -hmm. plants grow better. Well, 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 yeah, and I mean, you know, um, like, you know, um, Vladimir Putin's own uh, Arctic, Antarctic scientists um, looking at ice core samples, and I, I'm no expert on this, but they talked him into signing, to not signing the Kyoto Accord some years ago, because they said, look, it's very possible that they've got the direction of causation backwards, that, that um, rather than increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causing periods of warming, periods of warming caused by other factors likely produce an increase in the amount of life and, and resultant increases in the level of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, which is to say you've got the cause-effect relationship backwards. That was one of my you know? Eureka moments, because I watched Al Gore's movie and I was totally convinced by it. And he puts up this gigantic chart of CO2 and temperature. And then he says, well, mm -hmm. something jumps out at you. There's a correlation. Yes. <laughs> Get this, you guys. Correlation does not equal cause. That's a very <laughs> fundamental principle. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I believe it's been proven, although some people may still contest it, that if you look at the time factor, that the, it's the warming signal that precedes the CO2 by 400 years. You cannot have a a, mm -hmm. a, an, a cause coming after a, an effect, or vice versa. So that suggests mm -hmm. that, in fact, it does work that way. 
And yeah. when I yeah. realized that, that's when I really started to wonder, you know, and I really reevaluated my whole approach to this question because I felt like uh, Mr. Gore, and I voted for him, you know, and, you know, I, mm -hmm. at the time I was. His, his politics were insane. No, he was a very credible guy. I, I, I you know. You know, on other subjects. It was only later, yeah. you know. Yeah. I don't think he invented the internet, but other things, <laughs> Al Gore was good on. <laughs> uh, I remember in the late 80s, one of the guys from science came to me at the University of Virginia and said, Are you on the net? And I thought, Well. <laughs> If I don't know what the net is, I'm probably not on the net. <laughs> you know? uh, and he met the uh, what what I guess was a precursor of the internet back then. Right. <laughs> the dark. The dark thing. Internet, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, well, well, I don't want to stretch this out longer. Than, but but thank, thank you so much for for coming and uh, you know. By the way, uh, the. the the one that I did three years ago, I, I did do a Taggarty recording, and the the mic was so overbearing. It, it, you know how recording when you have the mic level up too high, it, you can hear it, uh, uh, but it's it's a bit distorted. Um, that's what the recording is like. But there is a recording of this uh, on. Um, on YouTube already. Have you thought oh, about publishing this paper? Well, it, it's it's out there. I haven't thought of publishing in a in a journal or something. Maybe I have a suggestion if, if you're interested. Of a, uh, you know the website? What's up with that? Or, or, or what's up? Anthony Watts is uh, oh website. No, um, it gets, it's a there's yeah. lots of readers but, there. Yeah, but so. see it it. Uh, which is interesting. Now, it actually is out there published on the web because I, I, I did some things for a libertarian um, uh -huh. political site and I gave them, I thought, well, I'm going to give these guys the right of first refusal because they published some of my stuff in the past and so they did put it out there. It's they might still be interested you know, in it. If you send it to them, if you're interested in said, just tell them that it's, it yeah. has appeared elsewhere. They might still be interested in it. I don't know. I published an okay. article there. Uh -huh. The only thing I ever published on this topic. Uh -huh. but I read well, that's that. interesting. Well, give me the give me the uh, yeah. link to your article. I'm I'm going to stop this.